morning. Thank you, sir. Um, subcommittee to come to order. I ask the unanimous consent chair be authorized to declare recess at any time during a hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask the unanimous consent that members not in the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your mic from you unless speaking. If you um, make noise, uh, we'll yell at you. Uh, to insert a document into the record, please have your staff email documents, tni at mail.us.gov. All right. And don't go through as many formalities at the beginning as we used to, which is good. Well, um, uh, Chairman Payne uh, is, is delayed, so I will be uh, sharing here today. Uh, so um, I, I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses uh, for being here. Um, it's, it's kind of an unusual thing, having been on the committee a long time and observed these hearings, but I, I haven't seen too many times when rail labor Railroad shippers and Amtrak uh, are all raising uh, similar concerns uh, about the way the freight rail industry is operating. Um, and to say that I'm concerned and share their concerns uh, is an understatement. Uh, the STB, Service Transportation Board, is heavily focused on ensuring the economic vitality of the railroads. Um, when it should be supporting a balanced national freight rail system that serves its customers well. Uh, you know, 42 years after staggers, at that point, uh, the freight industry was in uh, very dire straits. Uh, 27 years after Congress replaced the ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission, with the Surface Transportation Board, uh, the balance of power has swung too far. Uh, Wall Street is destroying the freight rail industry, as they are many other industries in the United States of America, as they did when they put uh, pressure on Boeing and we ended up with uh, horrible tragedies. Uh, we used to, I used to say, well, we have the greatest freight network in the world, and uh, it's not, and it can be, and not be incompatible with a decent passenger rail network. Uh, unfortunately, the state of the freight rail industry is deteriorating, uh, all after the model of the uh, not um, mourned uh, Hunter Harrison, who came up with the idea of precision scheduled railroading, i.e., um, you know, just look at the bottom line, not the efficiency for your shippers, uh, not the safety of your railroad, uh, and uh, it has spread like a disease uh, through the industry since he corrupted CSX. Um, and, you know, it, it's just, it's very sad. I mean, you can't just infinitely, uh, you know, increase your quarterly profits uh, with ever-decreasing operating ratios. Uh, so far, uh, freight rail has... Uh, laid off nearly one-third of their workforce since 2015. They've parked locomotives, closed rail yards, causing a number of shippers to temporarily close plants and facilities uh, due to erratic rail service. Uh, the uh, rail for workforce strains are under pressures to do more with less. Shrunken employee count continues to unreliable shipper service, worker fatigue, low morale. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, the investors on Wall Street have demanded stock buybacks, nonstop returns on investment. Uh, pandemic has exacerbated uh, the effects of pressure that began years ago to cut, cut, cut. Now, after years of shrinking footprints and workforce, class ones find they have cut too far. The reopening facilities they close to save costs and desperately trying to rehire workers uh, who have seen the industry change before their eyes. The class ones uh, left themselves so little cushion uh, been, uh, and been unable to adjust for winter in Chicago, flooding in the Midwest, Southeast, wildfires in the West. Uh, weather events like these happen every year. They're getting worse due to climate change, and yet they are consistently used as an excuse for degrade, degraded or degrading service. Our, our national policy to reduce the transport sector's carbon emissions cannot be achieved if the freight railroads are cutting service to less lucrative shippers. We need the freight railroads to be serving more customers at a time when the overall volume of goods transported in the country is skyrocketing. 
Uh, railroads consistently tell us how if 25% of the truck traffic moving at 750 miles went by rail, it said greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I agree with that goal. We've seen, all seen the ads on television. Um, you know, they are more efficient, but you can't be part of the solution uh, if you're following uh, just uh, the stock ticker price and the pressures uh, of Wall Street. Um, you know, according to the Service Transportation Board, outside of coal, the railroads have lost market share to trucks for the past 15 years. They're cherry picking only the most profitable routes, working to make the less profitable routes as unappealing as possible, uh, and forcing that freight to trucks. Um, you know, I've spent uh, my concern raising concerns about uh, Wall Street and its uh, attack on American industry and American workers. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, now uh, it has come uh, to freight rail. I, I want to have a healthy and the best, most robust freight rail market in the world, keeping trucks off the road. And I do want to have a viable passenger rail network. These two things do not need to be incompatible. And I believe the Service Transportation Board is going to play a very key role in moving us in that direction. Uh, with that, uh, I yield back to balance my time, and I would now recognize a ranking member of Crawford's opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you uh, covering down for your colleague, Mr. Payne. I thank him for holding this hearing, and uh, thank you to our witnesses for participating today. Today's hearing will examine stakeholder perspectives on the Surface Transportation Board's role in regulating the freight railroad industry and thoughts on the STB's reauthorization. The STB is an independent agency that generally ensures that freight railroads operate in an efficient, economically competitive manner that serves the interests of freight carriers, shippers, and other interested parties. This year, the STB is busier than ever as it reviews an important reciprocal switching rule, a merger between two Class I freight railroads, and potential expansion of Amtrak service. The STB must always weigh any consideration of further industry regulations with the deregulatory spirit of the Staggers Act, which opened the freight industry to increased competition lower rates and efficiencies that benefit all interested parties. The STB was last authorized in 2015 through, fis through fiscal year 2020. It has sub subsequently received funding through continuing resolutions. I commend the chair for holding this hearing today and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Okay, thank the gentleman for his brevity. And um, since I'm, we have no ranking member, uh, I guess we'll now proceed uh, to witnesses. Uh, the first witness uh, will be uh, Chris John, uh, the President and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. Uh, Mr. John, uh, you are recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning to everyone, uh, Ranking Member Crawford and the other members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about the Surface Transportation Board. Freight rail is critical so to supporting the everyday operations of ACC member companies. Our industry is one of the largest customers of freight rail, both by volume and revenue, and we're on track to be an even bigger customer in the future. Now, during his State of the Union address last week, the president talked about a number of new factories being built across the country and the growth of manufacturing jobs here in the United States. The business of chemistry is playing a major role in the revitalization of American manufacturing by making historic levels of investment. Our industry has announced expenditures of more than $200 billion and over 350 chemical manufacturing projects here in the United States. And as a result of this growth, we'll need to transport 200,000 additional rail car shipments per year by 2030. These shipments are important to every segment of the economy and the supply chain. Now the Stagers Act set a course that helped put the rail industry on the road to recovery and thrive, and that's certainly a good thing. Our members need railroads to be safe, innovative, and successful. And this should give the board the confidence to move ahead on other equally important objectives also mandated by the Staggers Act. Number one, to ensure effective competition among railroads. Number two, maintain reasonable rates in the absence of competition. Fulfilling this mission is vitally important and railroads, again, need to be financially strong to serve their customers and invest for future growth. At the same time, rail customers need reliable service and reasonable rates. 
Competition and market forces provide the best means to balance these goals. Policies that promote greater competition within the railroad industry help make it a more attractive and viable option to move freight. However, most ACC members and other rail customers do not have competitive options, leaving them without market remedies and solely dependent on the STB when faced with unreasonable rates or service failures. The railroad industry of today looks very different than it did in the 1980s when STB policies were first put, adopted. And uh, as we go forward, we need to make changes and modernize these rules to adapt along with the rail industry. So let me give you a couple of examples. Consolidation has significantly reduced the number of class one railroads. This in turn has greatly limited access to competitive rail service and led to sharp increases in prices for shipping goods by rail. As one expert recently pointed out, competitive pricing has not, is no longer the norm and rail customers have to pay a substantial price for the consolidation of railroads market power. And in fact, the SDB's most recent analysis shows that since 2004, rates have increased by 30% more than inflation. Rail rates also outpace increases in long haul trucking rates over that same time period. In addition to consolidation of mergers, railroads have dramatically changed their operations under the adoption of precision scheduled railroading. These changes have negatively impacted service and harmed many shippers and their customers through additional costs and service failures. Given the impact of these changes, the board must adopt changes that are better equipped to address current challenges and current problems. So we commend SDB Chairman Overman and the other members of the board for working with all stakeholders to develop sensible policy changes. There are several helpful reforms currently underway at the STB, but there's one that I would specifically like to mention today. ACC supports the board's proposal to update its rules on reciprocal switching. This long overdue change would help fulfill one of the primary goals of the Staggers Act by providing greater access to competitive rail service. Canada has demonstrated that a similar approach can promote competition without harming the financial health of the rail companies or the resiliency of the network. We hope that this committee also values the importance of the STB. The new approaches being considered by the board can help support American manufacturing and successful railroads. We'd like to work with you to help ensure the board has the resources it needs to help fulfill its congressional mandate. As the committee moves forward with legislation to reauthorize the STB, ACC urges you to consider the following recommendations. Number one, ensure the board has adequate staff and funding to keep pace with changes to the rail network. Number two, create a better process for collecting data on um, rail rates. And number three, provide meaningful remedies for rail service failures. We appreciate your leadership on freight rail issues and we wanna work with it, you in any way we can to help serve shippers and railroads. Thank you. Exactly five minutes, uh, gentlemen, to be congratulated. Uh, and thank you for that substantive testimony. Uh, now uh, we will hear from uh, Dennis Newman, Executive Vice President of Planning Strategy and Accessibility for Amtrak. Uh, Mr. Newman, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, and members of this subcommittee. My name is Dennis Newman, and I am Amtrak's Executive Vice President for Strategy, Planning, and Accessibility. On behalf of Amtrak's over 17,000 hardworking and dedicated employees, thank you for allowing me to testify before this subcommittee and share with you Amtrak's views on the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Board. When Congress created the STB in 1995, passenger rail was simply not top of mind. However, many things have changed since then. First, Congress has made several important updates to the law providing the STB with new responsibilities regarding Amtrak. Second, the on-time performance of Amtrak trains has deteriorated due to some host railroads ignoring Amtrak's statutory preference rights over freight trains. And third, some railroad mergers have had lasting service impacts on Amtrak train performance and have even jeopardized the continued operation of certain Amtrak routes. Therefore, given what has happened over the past 26 years, and how your constituents are often delayed or ignored by some freight railroads, it is critical that the STB be equipped with the tools and resources necessary to help ensure a modern, well-functioning passenger rail network in America. 
While my written testimony includes a number of STB related reauthorization proposals, I'd like to highlight three particular items for this subcommittee to consider. The first, the STB passenger rail program. In the IIJA, Congress explicitly said that the STB shall establish a passenger rail program and hire up to 10 additional employees to assist the board in doing this important work. Now that the IIJA is law, we need Congress to provide the STB with the federal funds necessary to hire the staff to focus on its responsibilities with respect to passenger rail, such as conducting investigations into substandard performance. That brings me to the second priority I'd like to highlight. It's important to clarify that when a complaint is brought to the board to look into substandard on-time performance, the board will not just treat it as another adversarial proceeding, but rather actively investigate the causes and remedies for that poor performance. This will strengthen an enforcement tool that already exists and clarify the key role that the board can and should play in remedying chronic on-time performance issues. Now, finally, to complement the authority the STB has to investigate substandard performance, the U.S. Attorney General has the authority to bring a case to enforce provisions of the Rail Passenger Service Act, including the preference law. However, as you may expect, the Department of Justice is very busy with a number of other pressing matters, and unfortunately, DOJ has brought only one preference case in 49 years. Therefore, in order to ensure freight railroads are not ignoring the law and delaying your constituents, Amtrak is requesting that we be provided with the ability to also bring a case to district court when our rights are being violated by a host railroad. I want to thank Chairman DeFazio for his hard work on this issue and for including preference enforcement in the Moving Forward Act. As we know, this important provision was ultimately not included in the IIJA, but we cannot give up this fight. I also want to thank Chairman Payne for introducing a standalone bill, H.R. 2937, the Rail Passenger Fairness Act. And I ask members of this subcommittee to support this critical piece of legislation if they are tired of their constituents being delayed by certain freight railroads. With these additional tools and resources, Amtrak believes our passengers and your constituents could finally have the service that they deserve. Now, before I end, I want to stress one really important point. There is absolutely no reason why this nation cannot have both a world-class freight rail network and a modern expanded intercity passenger rail service. Amtrak wants both to succeed. There are many examples of Amtrak and our state partners working cooperatively with host railroads to deliver performance improvements and network expansion with publicly funded investments that benefit all rail users. We have supported rail mergers that will benefit Amtrak performance and facilitate service expansion, like the proposed CPKCS merger. With this subcommittee's help, we believe that building a system that works for both freight and passenger rail is possible. Thank you for all your support thus far and for your time this morning. I look forward to your questions. Okay, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we'd now turn to uh, uh, Mr. Ian Jeffries, President and CEO of the American Association Association of American Railroads. Uh, Ms. Jeffries, recognized for five minutes. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here before you today. The past few years have reinforced a key truth. Railroads are an integral part of not only domestic commerce, but also global supply chains. This is no accident. For decades, railroads have invested heavily in their top-rated infrastructure, people, and technology operating 24-7 to keep goods moving. The numbers tell the story. Average annual investments of $25 billion a year, the train accident rate down 31% since the year 2000, and record or near record volumes of intermodal containers, chemicals, grain, and others in the year 2021. Rail transportation also reduces overall emissions, accounting for just 2% of transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions while moving 40% of goods. And class one freight rail employees earn total compensation more than 30% higher than the average US employee. As we discuss the STB and economic regulation, let me be clear about one key point. The current regulatory structure makes sense. Rail rates are 44% lower than they were in 1980. And true, rates are modestly higher than they were years ago. 
today roughly equal to where they were in 1990, 32 years ago. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, since 2017 through the end of 2021, the cost of ship by rail has risen at a level approximately half that of long haul trucking, even though trucks compete on infrastructure subsidized by taxpayer expense. The focus at the STB should be a policy environment to meet projected future freight movement needs without sacrificing the industry's ability to make progress towards safety and environmental goals. DOT projects a 50% increase in freight by 2050. The more of that freight that moves by rail, the better for the environment, for congestion, and for highway degradation. But sufficient capacity is critical to meet this demand. As the statute states, railroads must be able to earn the necessary revenues for the infrastructure and investment needed to meet the present and future demand for rail service. The current market-based regulatory framework developed on a bipartisan basis has been fundamental to the railroad's ability to meet demands to date. This system provides the requisite balance. Railroads can compete for business with an appropriate regulatory backstop where markets fail. Therefore, the current push by some for the STP, excuse me, B, to enact re-regulatory policies like force switching is backwards looking and wrongheaded. Make no mistake, force switching would undermine fluidity, disincentivize investment and increase emissions, all at a time when supply chains are still experiencing disruptions from the pandemic. Railroads already switch traffic today where it makes sense. And customers can position for a switch if a railroad shows anti-competitive conduct. The current proposal at the board would remove that standard, transforming switching from a remedy into a right. Some point to rail profitability as justification for a new regulation. This is absurd. Penalizing success is bad public policy and short-sighted, especially when that success has led to consistently high investment levels back into our networks, levels that far exceed other industries represented here today as a percentage of revenue. And that level of investment is necessary to meet forecasted demand. While some members of the fewest largest trade groups might benefit in the short term from forced access, many customers would be harmed as would the health of the overall rail network. Fortunately, the public record shows broad opposition from leading economists, from rail labor, from passenger rail, environmental advocates, and state and local leaders. Most notably, I sincerely think the 41 committee members represented here today both Democrats and Republicans who wrote to the STB in opposition to a forced switching rule or urged extreme caution in this area. Re-regulation proponents argue that the STB's rate adjudication processes are cumbersome, time-consuming, and expensive. Then Congress should encourage the STB to identify common sense measures that would streamline rate case procedures while also remaining consistent with underlying economic principles and statutory requirements. At the same time, Congress should push the STB to implement cost benefit analyses to its proceedings as nearly all other agencies currently do to understand the real world impacts of their deliberations. In closing, railroads operate in a highly complex and dynamic market and we continue to work toward the top line goals of policymakers, specifically maximizing goods movement and doing so safely. Now is not the time for ill-conceived policy changes that would result in a decrease in freight fluidity and investment. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank the gentleman. Um, and I, I would urge witnesses, I, I know you all have written statements, but if you want to respond to anything that has been stated by another witness uh, in your five minutes, that would be fine with me. It gets uh, rather boring uh, reading your statements before the, meet, the hearing and then listening to you read your statements again. Um, uh, with that, I would turn to uh, Dennis Pierce, President of Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman DePazio, Ranking Member Crawford, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Uh, my name is Dennis Pierce. I am president of the oldest trade union in North America, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. Uh, I'm also president of the Teamsters Rail Conference, of which BOET is the founding member. My comments today will focus primarily on the class one freight railroads, but before I get into that, I think we should recognize that our members also carry millions of passengers on Amtrak, commuter and intercity passenger railroads. We should not forget that commuter rail carries 500 million passenger trips a year in the most congested portions of the shared national rail network. I'd like to start by telling you about the members of the BLET. 
we're in the front row. We're watching why shippers can't get their shipments. But our members are proud and hardworking Americans. They work long, hard careers, moving freight, America's freight safely and efficiently. They are the ultimate essential employee. But there's numerous problems that are facing, forcing our members to reconsider their career choices right now. The way they're being treated on a day in and day out basis, and the way the railroads are being mismanaged, in our opinion, is breeding misery and contempt for class one railroads. The root of these changes, as has already been discussed, generally come from the business model known as precision scheduled railroading, which is neither precise, it's not scheduled, and it's not railroading. Here's just one reason why. The vast majority of our members do not work scheduled jobs. That is a big misconception. They work on call at randomly chosen times dictated by rail management. In many cases, they get little, if any, advance notice of when that call will come. In recent years, they've been subjected to harsher and harsher attendance policies that demand they work day in and day out. These policies subject our members to disciplinary consequences, including termination even if they take time off because they're too tired or too sick to work safely. These policies are destroying the lives of our members, even to the point of destroying their families. These policies are part of a fewer employees doing more business model that is understaffing the railroads and destroying the supply chain with no regard to the impact on shippers. In some, today's class one's operating model is requiring our members to work longer trains, longer hours, longer round trips with less time at home than they receive in their away from home terminals in, in hotels in many cases. And if personal issues come up that require them to be at home more than their legal rest, they stand to be disciplined just to tend to their family matters. The workforce is stretched too far and there is no elasticity to handle even the slightest unplanned event on the railroad and those things happen daily. The point here is that poor safety and operating practices and burnt out workers only lead to poor and inefficient customer service. This is where the STB can come in. We know the STB is here to ensure that service from the railroads meets the needs of the customers. But PSR has thrown the needs of the customers as well as, as the needs of the employees out the window. In practical terms, PSR and PSR-like strategies have led to furloughs. And most importantly, longer, slower trains, clogged ports, and a workforce stretched to work beyond the point of safe operations. The current business model is to furlough employees and just make everyone that's left do more. This business model is delaying shipments, leaving store shelves half empty. We've all seen it. But STB can play a role in changing these business practices. BLET believes that STB playing a more active role in regulating railroads can help by handling service complaints in a timelier and more effective uh, manner. Addressing why shipments don't show up on time which our members see daily, and the related impact on the nation's supply chain is critical to the U.S. economy. One role for Congress would also be to better define the common carrier obligation so that the existing requirements can be effectively enforced by the Surface Transportation Board. This could also come with an attendant clarification that Congress affirms that STB is both capable and responsible for enforcement of the railroad's common carrier obligations. BLAT appreciates the opportunity to testify here today. My written comments get into much more detail, including our opposition to so-called reciprocal switching. Congress and STB should take an interest in what PSR is doing to shippers. And, and because of the impact and, and the core impact to the shippers, what it's doing to the employees of these railroads. And this is where Congress can help give STB the legislative tools to ensure that America's freight railroads provide a world-class service. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Uh, thank the gentleman uh, for his statement. Uh, we now turn to uh, Brad Hildebrand, uh, member of the National Industrial Transportation League and former vice president of Cargill uh, Rail and Barge League. Mr. Hildebrand. Good morning. Uh, distinguished members of the House Railroads, Pipelines, and Hazardous Materials Subcommittee, my name is Brad Hildebrand. I'm a member of NIT League and a recently retired vice president of Cargill Incorporated, where I worked for 39 years, spending the last 10 years leading Cargill's global rail and barge modes. I've also served on two different STV committees, the National Grain Car Council, where I was chair from 2013 to 15, and the Rail Energy Transportation Advisory Committee. I appreciate the opportunity of addressing NIT League's views on the reauthorization of the STB. As a member of NIT League, whose members include large and small rail shippers, we hope that Congress will give our recommendations thoughtful consideration. 
A lot has been said about precision scheduled railroading over the last five years. PSR is an operating methodology that has been championed by Wall Street to push railroads to improve their operating ratios and increase their bottom lines. I would be happy to take questions about PSR later. But simply put, the STB needs greater statutory authority to provide effective oversight of the freight rail industry. This is especially true in today's inflationary market. The implementation of PSR among nearly all class one railroads has simply heightened the problem with the lack of railroad to railroad competition. A main statutory goal of the Staggers Act of 1980 is to instill competition. Today, we find ourselves in a highly consolidated rail industry with at best duopolistic railroad behaviors and expectations. Nidlig is pleased that the board is once again considering its reciprocal switching proposal. It has taken over 10 years to get to this point. Nidlig asks that one, Congress, encourage the board to reach a final reciprocal switching decision as expeditiously as possible, and two, encourage additional avenues such as gateways for the board to consider that would facilitate railroad to railroad competition. Along with reciprocal switching, NITLEAG would like to point out the issues with bringing rate cases before the board. Despite various provisions in the STB Authorization Act of 2015, rate cases are long, expensive, and risky for all shippers. It is encouraging that the board is considering its proposed final offer rate review. Unfortunately, no significant action has been taken to reduce the burden and cost of bringing a large rate case to the board. There are no current rate cases outstanding before the STB, none. This signals that the system is broken and needs attention. For those shippers that are brave enough to bring a rate case to the STB, they've experienced the board taking years to reach a decision while having to spend thousands if not millions of dollars to conduct a case. I have personal experience where my former employer Cargill along with North American Freight Car Association has a pending empty mileage case before the board that started seven years ago. Shippers have become so discouraged that they have about given up bringing cases to the board. An area that we would like to see incorporated in the reauthorization is to provide statutory definition clarifying the common carry obligation. With no clear definition, the railroads are reducing service, demarketing lanes and commodities, and dictating terms and conditions that meet the railroad's goals. Adding more frustration is that the railroads do not incur any penalties when their service fails shippers. Having clarity around the definition of what it means to be a common carrier combined with the STB developing a standard by which to measure common carrier service performance should add accountability to the railroads to provide a level of service as required by statute. In addition, we ask Congress to increase the level of fines the board can assess when a railroad does not meet their common carry obligation. NITLEAG asked Congress to consider removing commodity exemptions. We strongly believe that all movements falling to the board's jurisdiction should have the opportunity to seek redress and relief without having to go through the existing protracted process of seeking a revocation of the exemption. In conclusion, it takes a long time for the STB to issue a ruling. When they do issue a decision, NITLEAG believes these decisions have gone in the railroad's favor. It is as the chickens need to convince the guard dog about what the fox is doing to them. All the while long, the fox does what foxes do when given the chance. Let me repeat that. The fox does what foxes do when given the chance. Thank you for your time and consideration of our recommendations. I, I thank the gentleman for his, his statement. Uh, and with that, we'd move uh, to our uh, final uh, Witness uh, Herman Eckstein, President of Private uh, Railcar Food and Beverage Association. Mr. Eckstein, five minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you for the sub to the subcommittee for holding this extremely important hearing. My name is Herman Hackstein. I am the president of the Private Railcar Food and Beverage Shippers Association. We call it PERFPA. My aim this morning is to shine some light on railroad performance, service, and financial burdens that are being felt by PERFPA members and to strongly support the STB and its role and perhaps more active role in railroading today. 
PERFA was formed in 2016. We, are com we have 18 global food and beverage companies that make up 100% of our membership. They are all major rail shippers and uniquely they all own rail assets. PERFA members have rail cars and have invested millions of dollars in rail infrastructure. That uniquely makes them more committed to rail and less able to simply move to other modes of transport when things in railroading aren't going so well. If a decision was made to go to another mode, that means parking millions of dollars of assets, which is seldom a wise decision. However, given late service of late, many of our members find themselves having to do that. PERFA members have skin in the game, and because of that, we deserve to be treated as such. The underlying issue, in our opinion, is competition. When there's a lack of competition, notably railroad to railroad competition for those that need that clarified, and especially at single serve facilities or captive shippers as they're called, the railroads are free to provide any service level at any cost. A good example of that was during the rollout of PSR and what the railroads did to their shippers. Where there's a lack of competition in a free market economy, it is incumbent upon the government, in this case, through the Service Transportation Board, per the Staggers Act, to intervene. PERFA members are not alone. Obviously, as the chairman pointed out when we started this morning, everybody has concerns today. But we don't need to look at concerns. We can look at the real facts that the railroads are not clearly presenting. And that is, the market is speaking. Unfortunately, freight is moving from rail to truck. And this is negatively impacting not only our supply chains, but our environment and our infrastructure. The results of a shipper survey published by Morgan Stanley just came out in January, said 30 to 40% of shippers surveyed are moving some or a significant portion of their freight volume from rail to truck. Data published by the American Trucking Association indicates that from 2017, the beginning of PSR, to 2021 financial, or sorry, final results, truck tonnage grew by three and a half percent, while rail tonnage shrunk by 5.1%. Interestingly enough, even the AAR's own website publishes rail traffic information. Quick look at their website shows that since PSR in 2017, rail carload traffic in the United States has shrunk by 11%. Even if you add in intermodal, rail traffic overall in tonnage has still shrunk by 5%. Assuming that most of this traffic is moving to truck, as the data would suggest, and using a very conservative measure, which would be three trucks for every rail car, this migration is adding four and a half million truckloads of shipments onto our highway every year. That additional volume is wearing out the infrastructure faster, it's creating unnecessary greenhouse gases, and it's impacting today's transportation capacity crunch. Our nation's rail advantage is hemorrhaging. The simple fact that rail volume is down and truck volumes are up illustrates that there's something wrong. That cannot be refuted. And the extra cost that our shippers are in incurring because they're having to ship in other modes is a contributing factor of today's inflation. When there's a lack in the marketplace of competition and our railroad volumes are plummeting, it is incumbent upon the government, and in this case, the Surface Transportation Board, per the Staggers Act, of 1980 to help us out. The railroads are financially strong. The Staggers Act in 1980 had two primary objectives, instill competition, stabilize the financial health of the railroads. They've certainly done the latter. We now need the help with the competition. Railroad financials are public information. I quickly called up the fourth quarter results at the end of 21, and it's amazing. And even in their financial results, they blatantly show all seven class one railroads had reduced volume in the fourth quarter of 2021 and all seven increased their revenue and increased their revenue per carload. They are shipping less and taking more. New authorization, we purpose supports 
a multi-year authorization at the highest levels for the Surface Transportation Board. We echo the concerns of the other folks and we are thankful that you had this hearing. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank the gentleman. Uh, with that, uh, we would now uh, turn to, uh, to questions. Um, it seems like uh, in listening to the panel, I, uh, we have one panelist presenting uh, the view that all is well. Uh, the STB does not need enhanced powers um, and the real industry is just doing wonderfully well. In fact, they, they did over the last 10 years on an inflation adjusted basis buy back almost $200 billion worth of stock. Uh, so I guess from the perspective of Wall Street uh, and uh, CEOs whose uh, salaries are tied to uh, stock price and bonuses, everything's great. But uh, all the other panelists are presenting a very disturbing view. Uh, I'd just like to know what the, the number one um, thing the STB could do succinctly uh, from each of the panelists. And then uh, if you can be succinct, then I'll ask Mr. Jeffries to respond. So uh, quick, Mr. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Succinctly, uh, reciprocal switching. So as I said in my testimony, uh, right now we're in a situation where three quarters of our members uh, do not have a competitive option. And so providing that option would reduce rates significantly. But also note that uh, there's a, something called the Rail Customer Coalition, that's 80 trade associations representing 9 million jobs and $5 trillion worth of economic activity in ag, in energy, and in manufacturing. And they all support taking that action. Well, um, I guess I'll interrupt. I, I was hoping to move more quickly, but, but Mr. Jeffries, uh, a group has said force switching is intended to lead to rate reductions without a plausible explanation for non-speculative competition-driven public benefits. These rate reductions are nothing more than a wealth transfer from the railroads to the shippers. In another, it says a force switching is not in the public interest, wealth transfer to more profitable entities. Um, anyone else uh, want to put up their highest priority quickly? If I may, uh, yep. PERFA would like to support. Yes. It is reciprocal switching. And uh, we believe the ability for the SDB to have enough power to be able to make these positive changes as quickly as possible. Um, we uh, absolutely 100% reciprocal switching. And for those who say it doesn't work, um, let's check with the two class ones that operate in Canada. It's worked fine there for many years. Okay. Um We've got some substantial agreement here. Anyone uh, on the panel have uh, the other than the freight railroads have a different view of the number one priority? Okay. So, what? Yeah, Brad Hildebrand, Ned Lake. Yep. Um, one of the things that I think I would, our, our members would like to see is the changing of the responsibility to prove guilt, if you will. Today, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have to prove to the STB as shippers that the railroad is doing something unreasonable to us. We would like that flipped around. Given the profitability and the viability of the railroads today, we think the railroads should be the ones that have to defend what they're doing in their rates as being reasonable and competitive versus us having to prove to the STB that they're unreasonable or uncompetitive. Okay, uh, thank you. Actually, uh, that's done it with other monopoly uh, industries. For instance, uh, utilities are regulated in that manner. Um, just one quick point. Um, the, the two people have made the uh, uh, point about inter-switching in Canada and it works, but we hear here it would be a disaster. Uh, can uh, Mr. John or Mr. Hildebrand, can you just briefly comment on Canada's uh, provision. Yeah, I'd be happy to jump. Yeah, I'd be happy to jump okay. in there. I mean, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, competition drives every single other segment of our economy. It drives innovation. It drives investment. We've seen that in Canada, as he's mentioned. Um, those companies 
have uh, increased their revenue and profits and improved their operational efficiency uh, while doing inter-switching. And they've said that publicly. The last thing I'll say is uh, a study recently came out and said competitive rates uh, in the United States are up 24% in the last 15 years. Non-competitive rates are up 230%. And so that's why we're looking for competitive switching. Okay, Mr. thank Chairman, you. Can I, may I comment on the- uh, It's gonna be real quick. Example. I've only got a few seconds left. Go ahead. Sure, I'd be glad to. So the, the Canadian rail system was built and designed with switching in mind. And the number of potential switches in Canada are remotely minuscule compared to the number of potential switches in the regime that the STB is proposing. Right now, switches can be ordered with a showing of anti-competitive conduct. That's the way it should be. It should not be a right to take one railroad's private property, give it to another for use at below market rates. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. My time has expired. I turn now to uh, Mr. Crawford for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm gonna direct this question to uh, Mr. Jeffries. We, under we understand that the STB is reviewing uh, a rule on reciprocal switching. How could reciprocal switching impact freight railroads' ability to transport goods and keep the supply chain moving? So right now, again, a the railroad railroads enter into switches on a voluntary basis when it's planned out, when it's when it's part of a strategic need. A shipper can also petition the STB for a switch when there's a demonstration of anti-competitive conduct. Um, Adding switches adds complexity to the rail network. It undermines fluidity. It adds complications. It um, it potentially, if if forced, if forced, if it becomes a, a right versus a remedy to some sort of wrongdoing, it creates a disincentive to investment. If I have a plant and I know at any given time my competitor could be given access to that plant, that doesn't give me a lot of reason to to make the long-term investments necessary. Force switching would provide a remedy or a right, a right to a handful of large shippers at the behest of them and at the cost of other customers and constituents across the entire rail network. That's why rail labor has opposed. Mr. Pierce and I probably aren't going to see eye to eye on a lot of things today. Um, that's one area where we do have a common agreement, common understanding, and common uh, policy view. The environmental crowd has, uh, has opposed, passenger rails have opposed, right-leaning groups have opposed, left-leaning groups have opposed, intermodal associations have opposed. It's not just class one railroads who see this as a bad idea. It's practically every user of the freight rail system save a few large shipper groups out there. It just doesn't make sense for the overall vibrancy and health of the system. Again, a switch can be ordered if a railroad is demonstrated to be acting in an anti-competitive way, and that's the appropriate measure not because a, a, a shipper wants a backdoor way to a rate cut. One of the policy suggestions in the Biden administration's recent supply chain report is to encourage the STB to require railroads to provide additional rights of way to passenger rail. How would that impact um, freight movement and on the supply chain? So let me start, I wanna be clear. I completely agree that we can have a, a healthy freight rail network and a healthy passenger rail network. And that's done best when, when all sides sit down together, uh, agree on the, the, the mutually agreed to outcome, agree the resources required, agrees who's going to apply those resources. We have win-win situations all over the country. But I have to say that including a recommendation that increasing the amount of passenger rail on the nation's freight railroads would somehow help alleviate supply chain problems is preposterous. And it really begs to question the, 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 the work that went into this report. It's silly. It's silly. And that's not an anti-passenger rail statement. It's just preposterous to think that adding passenger trains somehow helps the overall supply chain. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. And now I will um, give myself five minutes for questioning. Um, let's see. Yeah. There are a number of groups that are an important part of this conversation and have sent in their own views on STB's reauthorization. I have four statements that I would like to enter into the record. First comes from the Brotherhood of Maintenance Way Employees Division, the Brotherhood of Railroad Signalmen, International Association of Sheet Metal and Air Rail and Transportation Workers, Mechanical Division, 
and um, also the National Conference of Firemen and Oilers. The second comes from the Portland Cement Association. The third comes from the Freight Rail Customer Alliance. And the fourth comes from the Fertilizer Institute. I want to thank these groups for submitting statements uh, for the record. Without objection, so order. Mr. Hildebrand, one of my top priorities as chairman of the subcommittee is to remove barriers in the rail sector. A complex and archaic rate challenge pr process is one of, the, one of those barriers. Can you elaborate on how the SCB processes could provide a level of playing field for all shippers? One of the things that the STB is, is working on right now is final offer rate review, or what they call FOR. That's a streamlined approach to help uh, improve the accessibility of small rate cases. And we would definitely like to see the board push that forward. Now, the uh, certain five of the uh, seven class ones have come up with their own arbitrary system uh, to uh, look at small rate cases. Uh, the board is also considering that. We believe that as a shipper, you should have the right to choose either four or whatever comes out of, uh, from the AAR in the final ruling. We should have the right to pick which way we want to go. But clearly that opens up an opportunity for us to bring what we call small rate cases uh, to the board for them to rule on. We would definitely like them to rule faster, as I said in my testimony, than what they're ruling today. Uh, clearly, it's taking way, way too long to get a decision. So I don't know if that's staffing or other issues that are slowing them down, but what are we going to do to streamline processes to help expedite uh, cases to be heard and decided would be greatly appreciated by those of us that are in the shipping public. Absolutely. And, you know, the technology exists now that some of these archaic systems should still not be in place. And I hope this is an opportunity uh, to move forward in those areas. Um, Mr. Pierce and Mr. John, uh, I have serious concerns about the effect of precision and scheduled railroading, not only for the impact of workers, but also for the shippers that have no, no car, no move, that have to move their cargo. Running longer trains raises the possibility of safety concerns and could decrease the role of the rail in the nation's supply chain. Can you both explain how PSR has affected your work in the rail sector and how do you think Congress should act in response? Mr. Pierce, let's begin with you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Payne. Uh, I, I think it's really simple to explain. Uh, twice the train link, twice the amount of time to build that train, twice the amount of time to put that train away. Uh, if there's a, an unplanned emergency, twice the amount of time to walk that train. Now, we're running trains in excess of, of two to three miles on any given day. And members, if they are forced to walk that train are out there uh, literally for hours on end, just walking to the rear of the train and walking back. Uh, radio communications don't work that well that far. It has become a safety issue. At the same time, the, the railroad is literally shutting itself down by running trains do not fit their physical plant. Uh, we park shorter trains to run longer trains, and then we cruise because the trains that have the other crews that are parked don't have enough time to get to their terminal. All of this impacts the shipping. All of it prevents the, the, the cars from getting to where they need to go. It's as though the railroads don't really care what, if those cars ever get there, is our viewpoint. And I, I just one last thing. And there is no suggestion box for the employees to tell the railroad what they think they could do better. It doesn't exist. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to bring those issues here because we see it every day, what could be done more efficiently that is not happening right now. Thank you. Mr. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what we say about precision scale scheduled railroading is that it's doing less with less. Our experience there is that rates go up and velocity goes down. So just to give you one example, we've got a member of company, it's got multiple facilities in the Southeast. At one plant, 
they've lost 110 million pounds of production in 14 months. Another site has lost five and a half million pounds of production over six months. These are lost sales, not only for our members and exacerbate the inflation and the supply chain challenges we have, but they're also lost sales for the railroad. And I think that's really important. It's, we can't ship what we can't make. And it's what's worse is we have no recourse under the current system. So I wanna thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank um, Chairman DeFazio as well. I know you've requested a, a GAO report on precision scheduled railroading. And we look forward to the results of that report. Thank you. Thank you as, as we do as well. Uh, Mr. Newman, uh, as Railroad Subcommittee and longtime passenger rail, long -time passenger rail. I want to ensure I want to. that the American people feel the full benefits of the historic funding to IIJA invest in our rail work. Uh, doing so requires cooperation from all partners since so much of the freight and inner city passenger rail systems overlap. Can you describe the significance of the proceeding pending before you, um, the STB, to restore Amtrak's Gulf Coast service? Okay. Um, uh, yes, and, thank you. Thank and, you. And, and, we would ask you to submit that for the record because uh, my time has expired. Next, we will have Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great to see the witnesses. I'll be it. I can't wait till we get a time when we're, we're here in the same room again, uh, running hearings like we used to have prior to the pandemic. Uh, my first question is actually for Mr. Jeffries and Mr. John. The railroads talk about rates decreasing more than 40% since the Staggers Act. However, Mr. John has testified that rates have increased 30% in the past 20 years. Now, obviously, this seems contradictory. My question to both Mr. Jeffries and Mr. John is about rates. Have they been increasing or decreasing? And do you predict rates will increase or decrease in the coming years? Mr. Jeffries, go ahead. Well, thank you for the question. And I could not agree more. I wish we were doing this hearing in person and look forward to the, the opportunity to do that soon. So when you, when you take, think about rates, since 1980, rate, rail rates are down 40%, 44% to be exact. Uh, the number Mr. John used, I think, is from 2002, 2004, something along those lines that says rail rates are up 30%. And in my opening statement, I, I, I acquiesced that rates have increased in recent years. We are back to the levels that rates were in 1990, 32 years ago. And folks talk about the year 2017. Um, somebody mentioned that I think is this, this onset of PSR. Um, since December 2016 through December 2021, rail rates have increased roughly 20% rich writ large. Uh, it's about half that of long haul trucking and quite frankly, half that of many of the industries represented today. So yes, rates are back to where they were in 1990. Well, thank you, Mr. Jeffries. Mr. John? Thank you, Congressman. So rail rates did fall significantly in the 80s and 90s. However, that's uh, long since reversed. Um, you know, again, as Ian said, uh, since 2001, rail rates have risen twice as fast as both long haul trucking and inflation. I think the most important thing here, though, is what we're talking about. And I want to be really clear about this. On competitive routes, um, rates have gone up relatively little over a relatively long amount of time, 24% uh, over the past 15 years. In non-competitive uh, situations, captive shippers, three quarters of our member companies are captive. Um, those rates have gone up 230% over that same time. So it's really important to understand when we're talking about rates overall versus competitive and non-competitive rates. And so what's happened is after massive consolidation in the industry, Railroads have leveraged their market power to extract higher prices and shift costs to their customers. All right, thank you, one, Mr. One John. quick point on that, um, Congressman Davis. I think it's important to note that no shipper went from two to one railroad as the result of a merger at any point. And so this, this is thrown around a lot, but due to merger conditions, no one ever lost access to a second shipper because of a, a merger. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I, I got another question for both of you. If you could answer real quick, because I need some time to address an Amtrak issue that I ask about every time that I have somebody from Amtrak on 
at a hearing. But Ian and, and, and Chris, you know, most shippers have said that they support reciprocal switching, but AAR has said it will slow operations and harm shippers. Mr. John, why would shippers really quickly, why would they support something that will harm them? We wouldn't support something that will harm them. In fact, again, a similar system has worked in Canada for decades. Secondly, we have an, our own financial interest for the system to work quickly and smoothly. And so we're not looking for something to, to gum up the works. And third, the SDB ultimately has the control of this process. They don't have to approve that application. They have the opportunity to deny it if we apply for it. All right, Mr. Jeffries, would you like to explain from your point of view uh, why shippers will be harmed? Sure, absolutely, because it undermines fluidity, disincentivizes investments, and opens up one private company's network for use by another at the behest of a shipper. Um, I would say that there are large shippers that are, are pushing for this and might benefit in the short term, but the stakeholder group of concern is much, much broader than that, including uh, UPS filed in 2016 in opposition, rail labors filed in opposition, intermodal associations filed in opposition, environmental groups, um, passenger rails, filed an opposition. So the list goes on and on and on. And again, the board can act on a, a reciprocal switch request right now, but there has to be a demonstration of anti-competitive conduct. And we think that's the appropriate hurdle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeffries. I, I, I don't need a response for this from Mr. Newman or Mr. Jeffries, but once again, uh, the, the Amtrak line from Chicago through Champaign, Illinois, down to Carbondale, uh, has the worst on time performance. We've been dealing with the short shun issue with the CN and Amtrak. I've been told numerous times in hearings here by both Amtrak and, and the rail industry that we've got a solution, we're working it out. Still, I don't have an update as to when this is going to be completed, what technology is going to be utilized, and when can we begin to see progress. I certainly hope that I can get together with both of you in the future to figure this out, because I don't want to go through another hearing where we still don't have answers. Thank you. I yield back. Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. And let's hear from the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Malinowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our guests and witnesses. Um, Mr. Jeffries, it's good to see you again. Uh, I want to zoom out with you a little bit, no pun intended, and talk about capitalism. I'm a capitalism. I'm a capitalist. I, I think it's safe to assume that you are as well. Um, like you, I think that balanced regulation is the goal that we should be striving for here. Um, and I recognize, and as part of that discussion, that that our class one railroads are not nonprofits. You're you're in the business of succeeding financially, and I want you to succeed financially. But to me, responsible capitalists do certain things. They serve their investors, obviously, um, and your member companies have clearly been doing a very good job serving their investors in the last few years. But responsible customers also serve their customers. Um, they serve their employees. They treat them well. They treat them with respect. That's how you run a good, sustainable business. And based on what we've heard here today from your customers, from your employees, I, I think some of your companies are falling short here. And that's unfortunate because it gives this system of capitalism that we all support a bad name. Um, let me raise a couple of specific issues. Um, employees and employment. Um, before the hearing, I, I looked at, um, at some of the, the transcripts of the fourth quarter earning calls from some of your companies. And what they're all telling Wall Street right now is that they don't have the workers they need and that this is causing operational challenges. It's calling, causing some of the supply chain difficulties that we're all experiencing in the economy. So I wanna ask you, do you think that might have something to do with the fact that between 2015 and 2019, the class one railroads as part of this unyielding maximalist pursuit of efficiency eliminated 29,000 jobs, 17% of their workforce? So you're absolutely right that workforces were down going in the pandemic. Um, if you look at rail service metrics, they were actually pretty strong going in the pandemic. Um, but certainly the pandemic created an economic shock that no one saw coming. Additional layoffs were necessary due to the 30% decrease in rail traffic. Fortunately, demand has come back, came roaring back. And that's why railroads have been hiring across all crafts for the past 12 months. 
And are we where we want to be? Uh, no, hiring continues. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find an industry that isn't having challenges bringing people on board. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's cer certainly true. But I, I think, again, one of the arguments that we might have had in, in that period before the pandemic is that you need some slack in the system. Um, that, that you don't want to cut down to the bare bones uh, on the basis of a sort of an efficiency first philosophy, because you can predict the pandemic, but anyone can predict that there will be crises, there will be crises in the future that we can't predict. So, uh, I mean, wasn't that a mistake in, in, in effect from a, from, from a forward planning, long-term thinking point of view? So I don't, I, I don't want to, different railroads were in different places during that time frame. And so I can't speak for each individual railroad's decisions on what the appropriate employment base was for that railroad for its network. But I can tell you, regardless of their requisite employee bases, everyone went through challenges and has gone through challenges over the past three years, as has every industry. And the important thing is that all railroads are actively hiring where appropriate, where regions where they need to bring on more employees. And they're taking additional steps, signing bonuses and the, and the like to, uh, to make these careers uh, attractive because we do need the next generation of railroaders. We're a fully collectively bargained industry, as you know. Uh, wages and benefits are roughly $135,700 per employee on average. So these are good jobs, but it's also not a job that you can just hire somebody and they're on the street the next day. These are very skilled types of well, Exactly, jobs. which is which is why I think probably laying off that many skilled workers in the name of efficiency was a mistake. With, with the time I've left, if, if I could just ask you to address the stock buyback issue as well. I mean, the, the class ones have spent about $150 billion on rail infrastructure since 2010. That's fantastic. But in that same period, nearly $200 billion in stock buybacks. Like, so uh, explain say, that aspect of capitalism to us because it doesn't make sense for my maybe old fashioned view of how capitalism should work. So respectfully, I can't comment on individual investor decisions or investment decisions, but what I can say is that our industry, despite what you've said, continues to invest 18% of revenues back into their, their capital plant, which far exceeds most of our peer industries. Well, th thank you. I mean, we're making an enormous public investments as well in infrastructure that you are using. And, and when we see numbers like that, it does give me pause. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, years back. Now we'll hear from Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. Uh, my questions are gonna be for Chris John. Um, loaded question, I guess, Chris, uh, all the interruptions in supply chain across the country of course, as you know, Texas is huge on energy and other things. We produce a lot of chemicals. Have you, how have your members been affected by that interruption? We've been significantly impacted and it's been a significant challenge. I, earlier, I had detailed a, an example where we had one member in just one instance in the past year has lost over 110 million pounds of production of one plant and there was 6 million pounds of production in another plant. It's not only cost them sales, but also cost the railroad sales because we can't sell what we can't ship. Right. Um, so now I guess the question is, are there any potential shipper concerns with Amtrak's apparent intent to expand its services on freight lines across the national network? I know you've had that discussion. I've had to be off uh, line for a minute and back online for a minute. So uh, forgive me if it's redundant. Any concerns about that, Chris? Uh, so anything that stresses what's already an overstressed rail network is a concern for us. And so um, the rail network has had challenges over the past few years. COVID has made uh, that even a more significant challenge. Putting uh, another challenge on top of that seems to us to be uh, a poor strategy. What would you say is the percentage that the interruption uh, in supply chains has impacted y'all uh, across the country, I'm sure, but all of your... Uh, you know, the people per, pertain or chemical council folks. Yeah, so it, it really depends. It, yeah, Congressman, it depends on where you are. So uh, other railroads, some railroads have performed better than others in terms of uh, their, their, their performance. And so, uh, again, I've highlighted some places in the southeast where we've had particular problems. I would not say that there's anywhere, though, that it's up to snuff. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. 
So what about, what is your response to concerns voiced by the freight railroads to reciprocal switching rule? So again, we've got a uh, finding, uh, two things I guess I would say. One, and, and something I've not said yet before is, um, reciprocal switching was expressly contemplated by Congress in the Staggers Act. This is not something that's new. And under the Staggers Act, it calls for uh, competition among rail carriers to the extent possible. We're not getting that. So what we need then is reasonable rates when competition doesn't exist. And so what we're trying to do is create further competition. Uh, and so that's not something new. That's not something um, that's we haven't uh, tried in Canada already. We've talked about that previously. That has worked effectively there. And the uh, system works and the uh, railroads have grown. And finally, it's an opportunity for the railroads um, themselves to get more traffic and more of our work. We want to give them more business if they're more competitive. Oh, I see if I get myself un unmuted here. Well, thank you for that. And then finally, recommendations you might have for any potential STB reauthorization. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, a couple of things we'd look at to make sure that uh, the STB has enough staff and enough financial resources um, to give them the ability to do a better job on collecting data. Those are the couple of things I would point to. Okay, well, with that, I'm done with my questions. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to read, get into the record American Fuel Patrol and Petrochemical Manufacturers a letter dated March 8th, 2022 to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and the rest of the uh, group that says RE stakeholder views on surface transportation board reauthorization. Mr. Chairman. Without objection, I'm sorry. Thank you, that's right, thank you, I yield back. And eight other conversations going on behind me. Okay, uh, we next have, um, Mr. Moulton for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, begin with Mr. Newman. Uh, Mr. Newman, you have uh, an impressive background and uh, I wanted to ask you a, a question about passenger rail that actually extends a little bit beyond Amtrak. Um, the SDB of course has authority uh, beyond Amtrak as written into the law. Uh, for example, the STB has ruled that Texas Central, the high-speed rail project between Dallas and Houston, uh, with which Amtrak has a ticketing agreement, will qualify as part of the interstate rail network and fall under STB jurisdiction. Can you tell me what role can STB reauthorization play in supporting private high-speed rail projects like Texas Central and Brightline West? Uh, well, well, thank you for the question, um, Congressman Moulton. Um, you know, from Amtrak's um, standpoint, we are are very much interested in being able to see improvements and increases in intercity passenger rail um, in in whatever provider might be able to uh, um, to be. Uh, providing that service. So um, to the extent that there is a need, um, you know, or recourse to the STB to uh, to encourage the growth of intercity passenger rail um, for for other operators, um, you know, we think that that would be appropriate. Mr. Jeffries, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughtful response to my uh, questions for the record after our full committee's hearing on North American supply chain uh, issues last November. You probably recall that I asked how to shift more freight uh, from highway to rail, uh, which I think many people on the committee have acknowledged would be uh, good for congestion, good for the environment, uh, good for efficiency if it's done well. Do you agree that regulation of the freight rail industry by the STB should not inhibit and in fact should perhaps bolster this goal of shifting more traffic to rail? Uh, I could not agree more with that statement. Absolutely. Um, you know, we intermodal intermodal uh, traffic is over half rail traffic right now. That's going to continue to grow. It should continue to grow. When you look at the the consumer demand we're seeing in this country, um, last year over the first six months of 2021, freight rail moved more intermodal units than they had at any six month period in their history. 
but we want to take on more because we think it's it's good for the environment, it's good for congestion, it's good for high rate, highway degradation, and quite frankly, a good public policy goal. So absolutely. So you've you've also noted in your response that uh, capacity is key, uh, and there are capacity constraints on the on the on the railroads today. Um, I have to say that you know when you when you see these numbers that you've invested 150 billion in capacity infrastructure improvements, um, but as Mr. Malinowski pointed out, 200 billion in stack buy, stock buybacks, that doesn't make us feel like that you're striking that balance right. Um, because you obviously, if we could be, you know, if you put that 200 billion into capacity, think about how much uh, more we could have. Uh, how do you think about prioritizing that balance? So when you're making an investment into the rail network, you're making a 50 year, if not 100 year investment. And so you need to invest not only for the, the demand today, but of course, keep making those long term investments. Um, I can't comment on investor relations decisions, but what I can say is that sustained level of investment that freight rail has been able to put back into its networks has resulted in an infrastructure that's the highest rated by the American Society of Civil Engineers. It's an investment level that far exceeds most other, most other industries in the U.S. with 18% of revenues going back into the capital plant. No, and, 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 and Ms. Ms. Chairs, I, I appreciate those numbers and you, if you shared them before. Um, I, I'm just trying to make the point here that, you know, you may not be able to comment on investor decisions as you, as you frame it. Um, but those investor decisions or investor relation, relationship decisions affect your relationships with your customers too, when you can't deliver the service that you, uh, that you could if you were able to put more into the infrastructure. I'm impressed with freight rail infrastructure. My point is that I think it could be better. And, and I wanna make sure that the STB finds its role in helping to uh, incentivize uh, that because I wanna see you grow your business even, even further. And while there's a tremendous focus on efficiency, uh, I do, I do sh share the concern of many members of this committee that we're not focused enough on on growth, and I'm not quite sure how we get there. You know, one of the things that you you also said is that um, when we we're talking about precision scheduled railroading, is that you know it doesn't have a one size fits all meeting, and, and and obviously if you're improving efficiency, if you're getting cars to their destination with less uh, switching, um, you know more direct routes, that's all good. But when we hear from shippers, as we have uh, this morning on the committee, that there are others who are not, you know, who are getting the service that they need, they're actually seeing their service uh, go down. Um, I, I wonder whether we're really finding the right definition for precision scheduled railroading here. If it's not really helping grow the business, it's just making what we have more efficient. Is that really the ultimate goal? Well, I think it's a it, it, service is absolutely a top line goal. Safety is the top line goal. Service is a top line goal. And we need to serve our entire customer network and look to do that every day. Now, are there areas where there are challenges? Absolutely. And I would, I would, I would probably ascertain that every industry is facing challenges in certain parts of its network right now. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we, we've got we've to try to serve all the customers we can. And growth is absolutely a key priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And next, we will have the distinguished gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burkett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate um, Ranking Member Dusty Johnson, the pride of T.F. Riggs High School. I believe he, he was the captain of the debate team and the wrestling team. Quite a combination, quite a combination. Uh, Mr. Jeffries, my district in East Tennessee is served by the Knoxville and Holston River Railroad, and that's a short line railroad that connects both the CSX and Norfolk Southern. Uh, can you talk about how forthcoming STB re regulations might impact short line railroads? Sure, absolutely. I, I would also say, remind me never to get involved with a guy who's a wrestler and a debate champ, but- yep. um, He'll talk you to death while he's beating your head in the ground. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, but more importantly, to your question, um, I can tell you that the short line railroad industry has, has filed in opposition and will be testifying in opposition of the reciprocal switching proposal that's pending before the STB. Uh, 
90% of issues, short lines and, and class ones are aligned on. Certainly there are areas where one's perhaps more important to the other. Um, but when it comes to STB issues, by and large, uh, the short lines uh, see eye to eye with, with the class ones on, on some of the larger uh, re-regulatory efforts that have been proposed or, or could be considered over that the board. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, some of the witness today suggested that the STB's reciprocal switching rule could actually increase competition within the rail industry and lower shipping costs. What do you make of that? Is that accurate or inaccurate? I'd say it's wholly inaccurate. Uh, the, the push for forced access, reciprocal switching, whatever you want to call it, is simply forcing one railroad to open up its network at the behest of a, a shipper. Um, and that's, that's not competition, that's just a wealth transfer. Uh, government directed wealth transfer, and it doesn't make sense. All right. Mr. Newman, um, what do you think the difference is between state supported and long distance service is? I'm sorry, uh, Congressman, could you, the, the difference between state supported and long distance uh, in what, what um, dimension? Uh, I, I assume in, uh, in reference to Amtrak. I didn't quite hear the question. Sorry. Uh, so the, the question was, what's the difference between um, state supported and, and long distance? Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Our, um, yes. So the, I mean, the, the under over routes that are over 750 miles are our long distance services. Um, those under 750 miles are the ones that we operate as a state supported service. And we, um, we therefore, um, contract and arrange with a state or a set of states for the operation of the service. Okay. Well, is Amtrak, are they, are y'all planning on expanding the rail service? I know wait, you are in 20 states. Is that correct? Over the next 15 years? Is that what I read? Uh, well, we, we actually look, we, we currently serve um, 46 states. We look to um, our, our vision for expanding passenger rail, which we introduced um, last year, Amtrak and Access, um, looked to identify a number of corridors that, which we think are good opportunities for the expansion of inner city passenger rail. There were um, roughly 20 new corridors laid out there. So that there's that that number 20, um, as well as increased service. I'm sorry, 29 um, increased service on another 34 existing corridors. Okay, I guess what I'm getting at is is the um, when you all expand in these states. Um, and I know you're looking for funding by the states. Are you going to ask for um, a decrease in your in appropriations for Amtrak to match that, or will it be on top of that? Uh, no, we we would we would not be looking for um, for a decrease in appropriations um, through under IIJA. Um, we have got now the um, that provides funding for for expansion for the capital that's needed for expanding our network. Um, and although we do contract with states and states do provide support for our state supported services, our annual appropriations are, are still needed for our, to, to fund our on, ongoing operations, um, both of our, um, our long distance and state supported service and, and our, our Northeast corridor. Do you ever see in the future at any time that Amtrak will actually cash flow? Uh, well, we, you know, a simple yes Actual, or no. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think in the near future, it's it, uh, no, and it's uh, very difficult to say. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back none of my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, the gentleman from Tennessee. Uh, now we will have Mr. Arkenclaus for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman. Do you need to discuss tangible ways can facilitate the even chain issues that are consumer businesses and companies in the Massachusetts fourth. Uh, those issues in the Massachusetts fourth are represented in today's panel with more than 350 jobs in my district, making up a portion of the American Chemistry Council. Mr. Jeffries, I, I'd like to begin with a, a few questions for you, uh, and really at, at about the intersection between rail and and the ports. We, we're all familiar with the challenge with port congestion and 
and how that congestion can ripple through uh, uh, the ports onto the rail system. Um, what has been the biggest cause of congestion in containers onto railroads, and how can the STB help address that? Thank you, Congressman. The, you, you, either on my end or, or your end, you broke up a little bit um, at the end of the question. So I believe the question was, was about uh, congestion at the ports and supply chains and, and what can be done to, to help address that. I apologize. Yeah. How, how, what has been the biggest cause of congestion and moving containers onto railroads and how can how can STB help address that? Sure, absolutely. So I would, <laughs> I would say there's there's maybe not one cause. Um, you know, the, the supply chain challenges kind of kind of run the gamut uh, throughout the the entire integrated supply chain, going from, you know, whether it's factory and uh, and Asia, you know, to to the ocean carrier uh, waiting off the coast to to be able to be unloaded, um, transloaded to to rail and and so forth. Um, but so I think you know we're we're seeing a number of different issues. Um, some of it at the port, some of it at the rail yard. Although we've been able to work through a, a decent amount of it, and a lot of that's well documented. It's it's lack of short haul truckers. It's lack of chassis. Um, it was, and depending on where you are, still is a a breakdown of of hours available to work. Um, Railroads operate 24 seven, always have, continue to, always will. Um, not every aspect of the supply chain works 24 seven. We did see the, the news over the over the fall that the ports of LA Long Beach did expand, um, but we, we need a supply chain that's functioning at, at full throttle across the board. Um, warehouse space continues to be a major challenge. You've got to have ish, you've got to have a place to take containers once they get onto the rail. Once they get to the yard, you've got to have truckers to pick them up. You've got to have chassis for the container to go on. You've got to have a warehouse to to take it to. And so, so Mr. Jeffries, in particular, how, can you just talk about what you think the STB could do in in these for any of these specific issues that you're raising? Sure. I think you know the STB and the the administration writ large is taking the appropriate approach of getting people in the room together and talking about what are what are solutions that uh, interested parties can take because most of this is is private to private to private. And so right. um, there's been some success there, and yes. that that stakeholder engagement uh, has been completely appropriate in my opinion. What's your view on on dock rail, and, and what role do you think it can play in lessening future port congestion? I think it's. Uh, I think it can play a very productive role, and certainly some of the the port infrastructure programs that have come out of the infrastructure bill provide opportunities for for additional build out. Of course, most of the uh, most of the the, the ports are, are public or public private partnerships. But when you're able to build out uh, on dock rail onto a spur, uh, you can immediately put that onto to train versus uh, going from from ship to truck to train. Um, you can take it inland into a uh, an intermodal yard where it can be transferred and get rid of some of that gridlock and traffic at the port itself. And frankly, it means more containers are going on train versus going on truck. And we think that's a good public policy goal. It's more business for the railroads. It's more jobs for Mr. Pierce's uh, uh, employees and our employees. And it's good for environment, good for degradation, good for um, good for environmental justice, good for any number of things. On this point about environmental efforts, um, can you expand more on how you're working to modernize freight rail with electric and hydrogen powered locomotives? And maybe just take 15 seconds I, or 30 seconds because I want to close the question for Mr. Hildebrand. Absolutely. Great question. So railroads are exploring battery electric, hydrogen power, increased use of biofuels. Um, you've seen reports of revenue service activities going on um, across different railroads. One railroad just bought 20 battery electric locomotives to use in switching. I'll say the infrastructure bill includes a number of programs coming out of DOE that'll provide funds for R&D into furthering those objectives and those goals. It's going to be a long-term process, not overnight, but something we're all excited about, and it's going to be necessary in order to re reduce our emissions goals. Or and Mr. Jeffries, would you, would you be willing to follow up on the record with some more about what you're doing as an industry on that Ab front? Absolutely. Be 15 more than seconds. Happy. All right, final question, Mr. Hildebrand, is your organization updating your members about funding opportunities, including in, in the bipartisan infrastructure law for grade crossing improvement programs? And if not, will you? I can't, I can't speak to that, I'm sorry. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yield back. Now we're here for Mr. Johnson for five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let's start with uh, 
Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Hildebrand, in his testimony, raised the issue that some commodities are exempt from a number of the STB provisions. He suggests there could be a, a every five years, a review of those exemptions. What are your thoughts? Is that workable? Well, I would, I, would, I would say there needs to be a demonstrated need for it. And right now, um, an entity can apply to have its commodity exemption uh, revoked or removed. And so that strikes me as the appropriate uh, process for that. Um, exemptions are there for a reason because there's a significant level of um, um, competition between modes. And, um, you know, unless proven otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion, at least, to... Uh, to just uh, you know, revoke those without cause. So, and you just alluded to this, but just from an educational perspective, was the, the rationale, because I think it was in the Staggers Act that these exemptions were allowed, is it that there is a high level of intermodal competition with this uh, fresh dairy and fresh meat, uh, th those sorts of ag products? Right, it's competition-based. Yeah, very good. Okay, so how about for Mr. Hildebrand? Mr. Jeffries, in his testimony, suggested that new regulations by the STB could be subject to a cost-benefit analysis, as is the case with a number of other federal agencies. Uh, Mr. Hildebrand, any reaction to that? Yeah, so, well, you know, in principle, whatever happens should make a uh, reasonable cost-benefit analysis and, and should clear a certain hurdle. So, you know, on a surface, not a big issue, but I, I think this is just the AAR trying to delay and or prolong some of the things that the board's trying to get accomplished. And if I may real quick about reciprocal switching, this isn't new in the United States, folks. This has been going on for many, many years. We're Mr. using Brand, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I got to cut you off because uh, I think reciprocal switching, we've talked a lot about that today. I want to get to some of the areas that haven't been uncovered yet. I will give you an opportunity, Mr. Hildebrand, if you wanted to add anything more to what Mr. Jeffries said about your uh, suggestion uh, of doing the commodity exemption review every five years, he suggested it was unnecessary. We think it's very important that uh, a path forward that's much easier than what's in, uh, involved today uh, to open up and remove exemptions is necessary. I mean, what do you have to lose um, if you're trying to compete for business today? What, what are they hiding from? What are they afraid of? This should be a process that, that is allowed uh, by the board to bring things uh, for uh, the removal of an exemption. A number of the witnesses talked a fair amount about the final offer rate review pending or the rule promulgation by the STB. I don't know that we've had as much discussion, anywhere near as much discussion on the voluntary arbitration process, uh, rule promulgation. And so maybe we'll start with Mr. Jeffries and then go to Mr. Hildebrand and then it can be an all play with the time we have left. Are, what do y'all's organizations think about that uh, pending rule? So... Uh, I think it's it's widely noted that that several class one railroads proposed a a paradigm for an alternative dispute resolution program through voluntary arbitration for smaller rate cases, recognizing that the rate case process uh, is is less accessible for for some smaller shippers. And uh, we are encouraged that the board reacted to that and and has put out uh, a potential proposal that takes a lot of those ideas. I think the important thing is, um, and this aligns with STB Chairman Oberman's goals, is it allows private parties to to work out uh, disputes and work out situations. Our challenge with the FORR proposal is that the STB is absolving itself of determining what the, the maximum reasonable rate is. It's either picking the rail suggestion or the shipper suggestion, and quite frankly, usurps its statutory own statutory authority, and it doesn't have statutory authority to be a baseball-style arbitrator. So we think voluntary arbitration is appropriate. We're willing to make commitments. We're staying in the program. And Mr. Jeffries, i got to cut you off because I do think yeah, that the FORR has been pretty well covered. Uh, Mr. Hildebrand, your thoughts on the voluntary arbitration process? Yeah, so the problem with that one is that they want to uh, keep it confidential. So if you file one of these cases under this provision, it will never see the light of day. So we'll never see how many of these things are out there, what's the decision, what's the rationale. They want to keep this confidential. That's why we object to it. So you don't think that would be helpful to small shippers? 
And that's sort of the value proposition. It will not be helpful because I don't think we'll use it. Why would we use it if we don't know anything about what's happened before, what kind of decisions were rendered? People are not going to use it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. I uh, now have the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me say thank you to the railroad industry for your help in trying to get the supply chain problems in line. Uh, and you've been on the front lines yourselves throughout this pandemic, and we appreciate that. And you have done it while causing much less pollution than some of the, our trucking friends. So thank you to the railroads for that. I have a question for uh, Mr. Newman and Mr. Pierce. Uh, Mr. Newman, you mentioned in your testimony that current uh, statutory pro provisions governing the STB's review of mergers uh, is essentially rubber stamped. And uh, since 1980s, we've gone from 33 railroads to seven, may soon be six. So I would ask you how those how that process works, how those mergers have affected uh, passengers. And then Mr. Pierce, as we push for more profit for the railroads from Wall Street, how have these mergers affected our railroad workers? And what can we do as we look to revise or um, reestablish or reauthorize this agency to protect those workers? Well, uh, I thank you for the question, um, Congresswoman Titus. And um, yeah, you know, with the we have seen in the past um, situations where the where mergers have caused um, uh, increased um, traffic and therefore delays. I mean, in some some cases in the past that there have been, um, you know, really were meltdowns as a result of, of the mergers that that really took quite a while for um, for our passenger traffic to recover from those delays. Um, so that you know our our concern with is that the STB um, have the ability to take take the public interest into account um, and and ensure that um, that that the, the public interest standard is a component of the STB's review um, as well as that the um, STB have the ability to um, to make directives to ensure that uh, passenger rail is able to um, to operate successfully in the um, in the wake of mergers. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Thank you. Uh, I think if you look back at the history of the big merger uh, push of the late '90s, there was said there were multiple meltdowns, a lot of missteps in, in trying to integrate workforces, integrate uh, what were once competing railroads into a single unit. Uh, with the two primary ones on the on the landscape coming forward with the uh, CPKCS and and the CSX acquisition of Pan Am, we've been very involved with the STB about trying to make sure that the protective conditions that the STB has the right to impose are included in any decisions to make sure that the workers get a fair shake when it comes to how these railroads are merged into a single entity. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that because it's not all just about profit, it's about safety as well. And speaking of safety, what about this uh, tendency to put together small trains into one long train that's carrying mixed cargo if there's a derailment or an accident, the exposure to the environment and to the people living nearby as well as the people on the train? I don't know, Mr. Jeffries, you want to address that? Sure. So I think when, when you look at train length versus incident, um, you know, there's there's not been any correlation there. Most incidents, leading cause of incidents is either human factors, track cause incidents. 2021, we had the lowest number of track cause incidents in the history of the industry. Um, but I think it's important to note that, again, when train links are massively vary in, in, uh, in length and over 90% of trains operating on any given day are under 7,500 feet long. Um, are there some that are longer? Absolutely. But railroads have the, 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 the infrastructure, design the infrastructure in order to, to meet the, the needs of a train length, whatever that might be. Do you think it would make a difference on the length of train for the number of people who are working on that train? Well, 
Congresswoman, as you know, I, you're, I think you're referring to uh, efforts to, to mandate two people physically located in the cab of a locomotive at all times. We're uh -huh. uh, vociferously opposed to that. Um, we don't think it makes sense from a safety standpoint. We propose potential alternative models where you have uh, crew also stationed outside of the train along the right of way. Um, should there be an unplanned event, uh, that crew person is there with the tools necessary in order to, to investigate it. Also work in a planned schedule, predictable hours. Um, my point being, I don't think it makes sense to mandate any sort of current operating paradigm and in perpetuity into the future because you never know what is going to evolve over time in order to allow for innovation, competitiveness, and related. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pierce. You want to weigh in on that? Quickly. Yeah, we uh, we we adamantly oh. disagree with with Mr. Jeffries on on the safety aspects of two person crews. Uh, the extra set of eyes and ears in the cab of a locomotive is essential to a safe railroad operation. And there's no data that shows that assigning those employees on the ground is going to come with an equal level of safety. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Nelms for five minutes. Announce. Sheriff, we can't hear you. We'll, we'll, we'll go to Mr. Balderson. Well, good morning, still, still morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and, and thank you all for being here. My first question is for Ian Jeffries. Uh, Mr. Jeffries, thank you. Um, in your testimony, you note to remain competitive, railroads must earn sufficient revenues to continually make significant investments in infrastructure, equipment, training, and technologies. And that if railroads are unable to make such infrastructure investments, there could be a cascading impact on the health of the rail network. Can you expand on the unintended consequences that forced switching could have on the infrastructure investments your members make every year? Sure, I'd be happy to, thank you. As, as this committee well knows, freight rail uses almost entirely its own funds to, to invest in, grow and maintain its capital network. And when you have a potential switching regime that would require one railroad to, to open up its private assets to another at the behest of a shipper, it, it, it can result in a disincentive to maintain that, that network. If you can't get a, a, a return on investment that supports continued investment. And that's not good for the rail network writ large. It's not good for most rail shippers. And quite frankly, it's not good for the highways. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for passenger rail. And so, our, our longstanding point is, and will continue to be, that we need a system that allows us to earn adequate revenues to invest back into the network. We've got to grow. Growth is absolutely key in order to meet the freight movement needs of this country today and into the future. And the STB has backstops in place. It has rate dispute adjudication processes. It has service remedy options. Can they be improved? Perhaps. We've offered ways to streamline these processes. I know shippers have as well. But let's improve what tools are there versus continuing to add additional tools, ill thought out tools that will result in undermining the fluidity and health of the freight rail network. Thank you for that. Uh, my next question is for Mr. John, and uh, I understand you and your members have different opinions on this issue than Mr. Jeffries and his members. But as real customers and users, do you share any concerns that the proposed changes to reciprocate switching could impact future rail investments in their infrastructure or technology? No, short answer is no. So look, competition drives investment in every sector of the economy. And that would be true here as well. A railroad would have the incentive to earn its business going forward and would have to invest and innovate as our members do in a globally competitive market. And so we would be looking for the same thing to happen here with this reciprocal switching proposal that has been pending for years at the SDB. 
and already works effectively in Canada. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you, both of you, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the gentlelady from California, Ms. Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Newman, uh, we were uh, last, just recently uh, notified that Amtrak will continue to operate several long distance routes and reduce frequency through at least May and likely into a peak summer session, season. We are told that Amtrak has insufficient staff and cannot operate seven day service as required by the American Rescue Plan Act. As Omicron recedes and the nation begins to travel substantially more in the summer, Amtrak needs to fully restore its most popular summer routes to everyday service. What's holding Amtrak back? And what are they doing to restore the service, full service as soon as possible? What methodology of recruitment are you using to bring back your laid off employees and uh, uh, recruit new employees? Uh, well, thank you for the question, Congressman Napolitano. And we, we, are, we are very much interested in um, getting our service back to, to full frequency as, as quickly as possible, um, as you stated, and, and of course, with um, to be able to operate safely. Um, you know, as you stated, we um, are at the moment challenged um, for staff. Um, and we are have really kicked up our um, our recruiting efforts. There, there, we have actually long ago recalled all of all employees who were who were laid off. So, so that's not um, our issue. Um, but we have more than doubled the um, the amount of um, our staff in talent acquisition. Um, we have got stepped up uh, efforts in um, in recruiting at at uh, trade trade fairs at um, trade schools. Uh, we have got uh, referral um, incentives for employees to refer other employees so that we can get more uh, more folks on staff. Um, we have got um, as well as bringing in more people. We're also working on retention. So um, we have got um, incentives to to keep employees um, from retiring and um, and and stay with us. So, you know, while we um, would would like to get that service restored, but we definitely do want to get that service restored as quickly as possible. How soon do you um, think it will, it, be? it will take a bit of time? How soon do Excuse you think we'll restore the service? Um, I think we'll have better visibility um, here in the next um, in the next month or two. Um, as we are, you know, as much as we're hiring, we also have got to get people through through training, um, get um, equipment Just, that needs to be checked. So, well, then, then would you mind letting some of us know so we can get the word out that you are recruiting? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. We can um, actually give you um, some good information on on what we are up to, and we will keep you informed as we move forward. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, uh, the next question will be for everybody. I've heard from businesses in my district that many uh, that have been long customers of the railroad. My constituent businesses have said railroad service has become less reliable and less efficient. The businesses contend the railroads don't provide on-time delivery and effective schedules they were used to for many years. The business also mentioned that when they have customer complaints, Railroads don't have enough customer service staff than they used to have to answer the, the questions. My question for all witnesses, why is this happening? If I can answer the question, this is Herman Haxtein from the Private Rail Car Food and Beverage Shippers Association. I believe it is happening because the railroads have reduced their workforce and reduced their resources by so much that they're unable, simply unable to keep up with the current demand. And what your constituents are telling you is clearly evident in all the other facts, which is freight is moving from the rail to truck because the railroads can't service their customers. Yeah, Mr. It's Jeffries, simply, then, thank you very much. I'm, I'm running short of time, but Mr. Jeffries, I understand from a report that uh, you're, you have less employees than you, and you have more cargo than many years prior. Why haven't you been able to up, up uh, uptick your labor force? Well, certainly the past few years have been a challenge. We've been actively ch hiring across uh, all crafts uh, throughout the railroads and uh, regionally where appropriate and continue to do that. Um, 
and we'll we'll continue to work until we have the the workforce that we feel is appropriate to to meet demand out there. Um, talent is uh, fiercely uh, there's fierce competition for good talent out there, and our workforce is highly skilled, highly trained, and uh, we need folks that that uh, that are up for the task and are uh, willing and able to to put in the time necessary because it's a uh, it is an industry that requires a high level of dedication, skill, and commitment. And we're, we're proud of the employees that we have, and we're always looking for more, especially today. Well, Mr. Jeffries, uh, same thing I told Mr. Newman. If you let us know that you have opening, we might be able to get you some recruits. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. General Lady yields back. We'll now have Mr. Stauber for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you all for coming today to speak a little bit about your industries and, and about how the STB reauthorization should look. As you all know, we are in a state of crisis when it comes to our supply chain, uh, supply chains and inf uh, in, uh, inflation. Uh, each is tied to the other in, in many ways. So there's no reason that families should be stressed uh, about how to feed their families as the cost of groceries continues to skyrocket and we are met with bare shelves at the store. The shippers, the rail industry, and our union workforce is working to keep food on the table and get products across the country in a timely fashion. We know that the rail industry is one of the most efficient parts of our, our supply chain. However, we also know that government regulation and overreach has made this job harder. Whether this falls within the STB reauthorization or not, and this question is for anyone. What could we do tomorrow to alleviate some of your biggest government-related stressors that make your jobs more difficult? Any of the panelists? I'll, I'll take a first crack on that. Um, you know, I think it's all about modernizing the regulatory structure. And that, <laughs> as I say that, that might mean something to Mr. John than it does to me when it comes to the STB. But um, you know, operationally, we need to we need to promote innovation. We need to promote technological deployment. That's going to result in more efficiency. That's going to result in a higher level of safety. It's not anti-worker. It's evolving the way that the business operates in a, an appropriate way that allows it to maintain competitiveness. Um, we need an economic an economic regulatory regime that promotes investment that works for shippers where there's a, a, a market failure and does so in a way that is timely and uh, relatively uh, less burdensome than it, than it perhaps is today, yet grounded in core economic principles. Thank you. Anybody else want I would to take a shot at that? Go ahead. Uh, con Congressman, if I could. Um, so I'd agree with Mr. Jeffries that we do need to modernize and update uh, the regulatory system. We've been, with all due respect, we've been trying for 40 years to make a broken system work. It's time to turn the page and try something new. In our view, that's reciprocal switching. That's been well discussed already. But the whole point under the Staggers Act is to increase competition among rail carriers. That's what we're trying to do here. So that would be the immediate step that's been pending at the STB for six years now. Thank you. If I can please add, if I can please add to that, this is Herman Hagstein. Getting effective oversight to make that competition act in the, to, to create a free market type environment needs to happen. And to your point, what can we do quickly? I think we need to remove some of the barriers so that the STB can give us that effective oversight. And I jump in real quick, if I may, just streamline the processes that we have to go through. If we're bringing up issues and our concerns and our problems, let's figure out how to streamline these things to make this more efficient for everybody. Uh, Mr. Congressman, if I'm yeah, go ahead. The, one of the challenges we talk a lot about staffing and, and even while Mr. Jeffries may be right that certain railroads are having trouble finding employees, certain railroads still have people furloughed while they're forcing others to work more. Add, adding insult to injury while you're offering incentives to hire, the nation's class one railroad employees have been two years without a contract. They work through a pandemic. The railroads are reporting record profits. And it's an insult to everyone that you're going to pay new employees more than the ones that got you through the crisis without a contract. So there's all sorts of things that could be done to alleviate the staffing problem. Mr. Pierce is representing the ongoing collective bargaining process that both sides have been in and continue to negotiate in. Um, well, thank you very much. I think that, go ahead. Was there one, uh, uh, another witness? Go ahead. 
uh, sorry, Congressman Dennis Newman from Amtrak. I, and I was just gonna say for a, a little uh, different perspective from our standpoint, um, being able to have the funding at the STB for the um, passenger rail office for um, so that, you know, efficient investigation of, of any performance issues that may be brought, um, I think would be helpful. Well, th thank you very much. As my time winds up, I appreciate those those comments, and it's something that I think uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle within this committee are, are hearing. So um, I think that we need to uh, work to alleviate some of these concerns and, and just bring certainty uh, to the industry. And I thank you all for pers participating today uh, and sharing your knowledge and expertise. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Mr. Lynch for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, for one, am very grateful uh, to our rail workers, uh, especially this last two years has been very, very difficult. They've been on the front lines and they have performed magnificently uh, on behalf of the American people in uh, doing that they, what they can to, to alleviate the supply chain uh, problems that we've had. <clears throat> Uh, I am I am deeply disappointed in in the layoffs that we experienced early on, and uh, part of you know as a former union president myself, I can tell you when you have layoffs in an industry, that is a red flag to anyone who's looking to uh, begin a career uh, in that industry because it it signals instability, and I also think that the the rate of consolidation in in rail has also uh, limited our op opportunity to attract more workers. They see Wall Street making more of the decisions to squeeze out employees. I think it's had a, a detrimental effect on the, the quality of, of uh, life for those employees. And also uh, I worry about our ability to attract the next generation of rail workers. Uh, President Pierce, uh, you, you've been, look, I, I, I've negotiated plenty of collective bargaining agreements during my career as an iron worker and also as a, as a labor attorney. Uh, can you talk to us about uh, the fact that we, we've lost so many skilled employees, some of them are still furloughed, uh, yet we have another uh, effort of, of bringing new people into the industry. Can you talk a little bit about the perspective of our regular rail workers and what they're dealing with on a daily basis? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I think it's a very critical part of what's wrong with the supply chain and what's wrong with staffing. Uh, as I said, our, our membership has been, and this is all rail unions, this isn't just mine. They've all been without a contract for over two years while the records made work, at work I mean record profits. Every, every profit report that came out this spring has been best ever. And the employees see that. And new people that want to go to work in a good industry see that. Uh, the continuing attack on the second person on the train, how do you hire conductors when you're telling them you want to get rid of them? That, that's counterproductive. Uh, add to this that, that these policies that the roads have adopting as part of PSR, forcing workers to work more, taking away their family life uh, at the expense of laying someone else off. And it, it's, it's absurd to me that there's any doubt as to why people are not interested in hiring out at the railroads right now. They're having a hard time even at job fairs. Ten people take the job, only five show up when they find out what it looks like. And that's my job. That's our job as unions to try to improve on that. But we need a willing partner across the table. And for two years, we've sat across the table with no willing partners to try to address these concerns. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not in on the, uh, the, the negotiations, obviously, but uh, you would think with all of the money that we have collectively in Congress uh, sent to our, our rail operators and uh, that, that, that that inducement would encourage them to be a little bit more uh, kind to, to our, our employees. And also, you know, we've seen that on the passenger side in my own district where we, we, we gave the, uh, the, the, the rail authority in Massachusetts, uh, about $1.5 billion, and they turned around and laid off 50, 50 conductors. We got that turned around uh, belatedly, but uh, you know there just seems to be a disconnect between what, what we're all trying to do and uh, some of the policies that we've observed. Uh, from, from a safety standpoint, uh, President Pierce, uh, how, how important it is, is it to have that second employee on that train, especially given the length of some of these trains? 
I think it's critical. I think the uh, second set of eyes and ears, the, the ability to, uh, I think, address issues that happen on the fly, uh, great crossing accidents, derailments. These are things where the ground crew goes back in, in short order to make sure that we're addressing these catastrophes as fast as we can. There's no replacement for that where you put someone on the ground in a truck and he can even get to the remote locations that, that conductors walk to every day from the head end of a train that's out there right where the accident occurs. So it, it's just one of many ways that this is a cost cutting mechanism. It is fewer people doing more work and it has nothing to do with the safe operation in our opinion. Thank you very much. Well, I have family uh, that are, are involved in rail and uh, they've got a long history there. And uh, hopefully you'll have greater success. I just, I wanna urge uh, the rail operators to, to sit down and bargain in good faith with our brothers and sisters in the rail unions. May um, I comment quickly Mr. before? Jim and I yield back. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sure. If, if I have time, I give it to you. Quickly. Very quickly, very quickly. Uh, one, uh, I'm not the negotiator. We have a separate organization that does that. Of course, we're negotiating in good faith. That's a long, gradual process. It works well under the Railway Labor Act. Number two, even in 2016, under the Obama administration, their proposed two-person crew requirement in the beginning of the rule stated there is no data to show that this rule improves safety. And three, just as a reminder, we don't take direct funds from the federal government. Um, we're almost entirely privately financed, owned and maintained, but your point is well taken there and we certainly supported the infrastructure bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, man. The gentleman yields back. And next we have Mr. Nels for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for being here. Uh, you can consider me a friend. Uh, I support the rail industry and, and appreciate everything you've done uh, throughout this pandemic and, and you do a great job for America. Uh, my question is really focused more to uh, Mr. U uh, Norm Newman. And uh, I have a gentleman here, his special agent, Michael Garbo. Special agent Garbo was killed on October 5th, two uh, 2021. He worked for the DEA and he was searching an Amtrak train heading from LA uh, to New Orleans when the train stopped in Tucson, Arizona. He was doing a search of that train and found some illegal substances, illegal drugs on that train. And obviously the suspect didn't like it. And then I'm getting in a firefight with Agent Garbo and took his life. And looking at, this caused me to pause and look at security apparatus the security on our rail system, and specifically Amtrak. And I believe that Amtrak lacks a basic security protocols, making it appealing to drug traffickers and other criminals. And it is possible to board a train without ID and take on bags without any sort of screening. And the reason I say that is I have staff and others that have jumped on an Amtrak train from DC here to, to, uh, to New York, and they've never been asked for an ID. They can buy a ticket, but they're not asked for an ID. Matter of fact, they can take bags on that train and none of those bags are scanned. And I think the American people would find this very, very difficult to understand that you, when you jump on an airplane, they want everything but a blood sample, but you can jump on an Amtrak train and not need any identification whatsoever and carry on bags without being scanned. And I find that very concerning. In the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Congress has allocated over 50 billion, with a B, 50 billion to Amtrak. And Mr. Newman, you state in your testimony that Amtrak will use that funding to begin the modernization of Amtrak's assets and initiate significant expansion of Amtrak's route network. Could you tell the committee today if Amtrak is planning on using any of the 50 plus billion to make basic security improvements, invest in the Amtrak police, or make the Amtrak experience safer for passengers by deterring crime on trains and in stations? Well, Congressman, thank you very much for the question. And the, the short answer is, is yes. Um, so that the, um, you know, some of the funding that's made available through to us through the IIJA is available for us to, to use on modernizing and upgrading our systems, including our safety and security systems. Um, and um, we, we similarly um, uh, are, are very interested in, in making improvements in the safety and security of our trains. Um, our Amtrak Police Department 
cooperates and works extensively with with um, Homeland Security, TSA, um, and um, you know, federal and local um, uh, security authorities to make sure that we've got good cooperative practices in place, that we're well coordinated, and that we, we can do everything that we can to ensure the safety of um, your constituents, our, um, our passengers, um, and, and the traveling public. But, but your current, but your current practice doesn't support that because you can jump on a train from here to New York and not have an ID. True or false? Uh, you That's can true. Jump on a you train. can jump on a plane without having an ID because it takes place every day. We we do have. Uh, and you can jump on a train with bags with bags loaded with drugs or whatever. You don't know what's in it, and you can jump on a train without having any bag scanned. That's true too. Uh, that is, and, that and you is stated that you got the fifty billion dollars, and that money could be everywhere. used, and that money could be used for safety and security enhancements. But you don't really have a plan in place. Well, I want to try to help you. I, I mean, I, I'm concerned about America. I'm concerned about our southern border, Mr. Newman. If you think about our southern border and the amount of substances and drugs coming through our southern border, because we really have no border security. I think Amtrak is actually enabling, enabling the problem because individuals with those drugs that get through our southern border can jump on one of your trains and you don't need an ID. You can be Billy Bob. You can be anybody you want. You can jump on that train with your drugs, your substances, and move it throughout the entire country because you're in several states. And I think that the American Congress people should be concerned about this. I want to be proactive instead of being reactive. And we'll give well, Congressman, the, uh, I, we'd be happy to get you more information and um, and discuss with you and 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 um, hear your ideas, give you okay. information about what we currently do, what security practices right. we have in place. So, and, so and my last my what, last what comment is is that I'm drafting legislation and I want to work with you. It's called the Passenger Rail Security Improvements Act of 2022, and I'm planning on introducing this month that would improve Amtrak's ticketing and baggage processes to make it more difficult to bring illegal drugs on board. It's not going to inconvenience your riders or hamper Amtrak's operation, but I think it's important that Amtrak uses the resources it's been given to modernize its security. So I want to work with you on this. And so would you like to sit down with me at some point in time and talk about this legislation? Yes, sir. We'd be happy to. That's great. We will be back. reaching out to you. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Gentlemen, time back. has expired. That concludes the hearing uh, for today. I would like to again thank each of the witnesses for your testimony today. I ask unanimous consent that the record today's hearing remain open until such as time our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing and that my opening statement be put into the record as well. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days and for any additional comments or information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection. This brings the subcommittee to adjournment.